It's easy to forget, especially living as we do in an age where nobody seems to care about history all that much, that democracy as we know it, in the grand scope of human civilization, has existed for around five minutes or so. Sure, there, there were ancient societies where the concept of democracy existed. The Athenian Republic lasted a few hundred years. The Roman, Roman Republic lasted half a millennium. But that democracy is not democracy as we know it today. Those democracies had very restrictive standards on who was allowed to do the voting. Democracy as we know it today means universal suffrage, the broadest possible eligibility criteria, and we take it for granted, at least most of us do, that high voter turnout is automatically preferable to low voter turnout. But if you traveled back in time, let's say 22 to 25 centuries, and you went up to one of those Greek or Roman Republicans and put it to them that true democracy means every adult citizen, male and female, gets the vote, they would have looked at you like you had a penis growing out the middle of your forehead. And you would have gotten that exact same reaction even right up until the middle of the 19th century. Universal suffrage, well, universal male suffrage, more specifically, was never seriously proposed anywhere in the world until the 1850s and 60s. In the United States, we didn't, didn't have universal male suffrage until the 14th Amendment in 1866, and it's another half century before women's suffrage starts to be seriously contemplated. And here's where we have a real problem in our current day discourse, where the Twitterization of the public intellect has rendered us pretty much completely incapable of having nuanced discussions about complex multifaceted topics, because we just want to jump to wild conclusions and call people names. As an example, consider this, this next sentence I'm about to say. We would do well to consider the unintended consequences that have resulted from universal suffrage. Many people, and I'm sure some already have, will infer that sentence as me stating my belief that universal suffrage is a bad thing, or that it should be reversed. But did I say that? I did not. Did I intimate that? I did not. Did I think that? I do not. But here's what I do think. I think sometimes we get so caught up in congratulating ourselves for doing the obviously correct thing, like granting the vote to all adult citizens, that we prohibit ourselves from acknowledging, much less discussing, that doing the correct thing might have ancillary consequences that we don't like so much. And we also prohibit ourselves from acknowledging, much less discussing, that down through the centuries and the millennia, there might have been good, proper, sensible reasons why certain people didn't want to do the thing that we view as being so immutably morally correct. So before universal male suffrage, in other words, the whole history of democracy up to the 1850s, what were the main arguments against it? Well, the main arguments against it were, number one, if we limit the voting to educated male landowners, then we will have a more literate, more well-informed electorate that makes better decisions. And number two, if we let poor people vote, then they're just going to vote for whoever is offering the most lavish free handouts from the government. Now, is either of those reasons a deal breaker why we shouldn't let all male citizens vote? No, of course not. But th does that mean both of those arguments are wrong? No, of course it doesn't. There's a lot of correctness in both of those arguments. And similarly, with women's suffrage, if you go back before the 1920s, a century ago, in other words, what were the main arguments against giving women the vote? Well, the biggest one went something like this. If we allow women to vote, we will have an electorate that is more easily swayed by spurious appeals to emotion and less governed by rationale. Now, is that a valid reason to d deny women the right to vote? Of course it isn't. Hell no. But is it something we can dismiss out of hand? I think anyone who's been paying attention to politics the last three or four decades can see that our political messaging, in addition to what we used to call our news coverage, they are more emotion-oriented today than they have ever been at any time before, and we would have to be self-deluding morons to not realize and acknowledge that much of that reality goes back to giving women the vote a hundred years ago. And there's another big component in that equation, too, the fact that 75% of journalism degrees are now being awarded to females. So in a period of 50 to 60 years, the news business goes from 95% male to three-quarters female, and we're supposed to pretend that's not going to cause drastic, far-reaching changes in the industry? 
And again, just so we're clear on this, I am not saying universal suffrage is bad. I'm not saying women shouldn't be news reporters. I'm saying good things sometimes have adverse ramifications, and we can't fix them if we pretend they don't exist. Jim Eagle, hit the music, please. From high atop the battlements of Castle Kermudge and home of the comeliest serving wedges in the whole kingdom and half-priced horns of ale on Thursday night. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America and all ships at sea. Welcome to the program. I am your eponymous host and humble servant. And if I were to ask you the name of the first act whereby the U.S. government prohibited the practice of involuntary human servitude, I think most people would say, easy, the Emancipation Proclamation. Ask me something hard, why don't you? Except... Nope, that's wrong. And some other people might say, well, it's got to be the 13th Amendment then, right? Nope, that's wrong too. The correct answer is the District of Columbia Compensated Emancipation Act enacted by the 37th Congress and signed into law by President Abraham Lincoln 162 years ago today, Wednesday, 16 April, 1862. So this is fully nine months before the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation, and it's a drastically different thing in any event. The Emancipation Proclamation was an executive war measure designed to degrade the enemy's ability to fight by, it was hoped, fomenting slave rebellions all across the Confederacy. So the proclamation basically decrees that all persons held in a condition of involuntary servitude in states that are actively engaged in armed rebellion against the Union are henceforth and forever free. It didn't make them citizens. It didn't even declare them human beings. And it didn't confer any rights. As a practical matter, it didn't really change the the, the status quo for anybody anywhere. No enslaved person magically became free the day after it was announced, that's for damn sure, but it's commonly said about the Emancipation Proclamation that, that it was the first signal from the U.S. government that ending the practice of slavery is going to be one of the end goals of putting down this rebellion and winning this war. But it wasn't, was it? Because the District of Columbia Compensated Emancipation Act came many months sooner, and it wasn't just a war proclamation from the president either. This was an actual act of Congress. And since the District of Columbia is the only place where the Congress directly governs a local municipality, this act, unlike the Emancipation Proclamation, actually caused enslaved people to gain their freedom overnight. And it was a pretty genius move on the part of the abolitionists in Congress because after the rebellion kicked off and all the southern senators and congressmen left Washington, everybody who was left looked around and said, you know, we've still got enough members here for a quorum and all the guys who would have obstructed the bill have gone home. So how about let's start doing all that stuff we've been wanting to do for years now. And this was a pet project for Abraham Lincoln, too, all the way back in 1849 when he was just a freshman congressman from Illinois. The first bill Lincoln ever brought to the floor was a bill that basically would have done the exact same thing that the 1862 law wound up doing. And he managed to get it to a floor vote, which is no small feat when you're just in your second term and you're a nobody backbencher from Illinois, but it lost pretty badly, which was no real surprise. But Lincoln did manage to strike a blow the very next year because he managed to get a prohibition on, on, on the buying and selling of enslaved persons in the federal district written into the text of the Compromise of 1850. And was that an empty token gesture? I mean, yeah, you can call it that. It wouldn't be unfair. Maryland and Virginia are both still slave states, so I'm sure it was a fairly simple matter to just hop over the boundary line and do your business on the other side. But you know what? I still think it's a pretty impressive showing for Mr. Lincoln. Remember, there's no Republican Party yet, so he is what's known as an anti-slavery Whig. And the soft-on-slavery Whigs, they find the anti-slavery Whigs pretty goddamn annoying, which is a big part of the reason why Lincoln loses his House seat in 1852 and pretty much, much gets disowned by his party. So he is a free agent four years later when the other disaffected anti-slavery Whigs who are organizing this new thing called the Republican Party come around to Abe's place and they say, Abe, we sure like the cut of your jib. You are a hardcore anti-slavery guy. We are a hardcore anti-slavery party. And we would be just delighted if you would stand as our nominee against Stephen Douglas in this upcoming Illinois Senate election. And Lincoln goes, all right, I guess. But see... 
If he hadn't done all that work in the House, first with the bill that failed on the floor vote and then with the Compromise of 1850, if he hadn't gone out of his way as a freshman Whig congressman to establish his anti-slavery street cred like that, who knows if he is even on the radar of the new Republican Party as a Senate candidate for 1856? And then he loses the damn Senate election. I mean, for the last few years of the 1850s, there are there are no two bigger failures in the country than Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant. Lincoln is shuffling along as a partner in a local law practice in Springfield. He'll never be able to live up to the expectations of his wife's wealthy family. And it's even worse for Grant. He's been thrown out of the army and forced to move his family into his parents' house and work in his old man's tannery shop. And half a decade later, they are two of the greatest men in history. So consider that the next time you think your destiny can't suddenly and drastically change in the middle of middle age. And here's another interesting thing about the 1862 bill, which you may have already discerned from its title. This bill was the only time in the whole story of the demise of involuntary human servitude on this continent when slaveholders actually received official compensation for the manumission of their former slaves, which... Maybe I'm just looking at it through a 21st century moral prism, but it just seems kind of self-defeating when you're proclaiming someone a full human being and also at the same time simultaneously treating them as, as confiscated property <laughs> requiring fiduciary recompense. I don't know. But when President Lincoln set his hand to the District of Columbia Compensated Emancipation Act, it manumitted all enslaved persons in the district with immediate effect. And it, is, it established a $1 million compensation fund for any dispossessed former slaveholders, so, so long as there was no evidence of them being rebels or rebel sympathizers, obviously. Another provision of the act establishes a second fund of $100,000 by which a $100 cash payment was offered to any formerly enslaved person willing to expatriate themselves to Haiti or Liberia. In order to receive compensation, erstwhile slaveholders were required to produce written evidence of ownership of the persons in question and swear a solemn and legally binding oath that they ain't no rebel and they ain't no rebel sympathizer. A three-man emancipation commission was impaneled pursuant to the act and tasked with adjudicating all questions of compensation. A majority of the petitioners, as one might expect, they were white folks, but... A surprising number of blacks also applied for compensation on the grounds of having bought the freedom of their own family members and thus becoming, for all legal intents and purposes, their rightful owner. As a result of the passage of the act, the commission reported that 3,185 persons in the District of Columbia were freed from a condition of involuntary servitude. And I think it sucks, frankly, that this story isn't more well-known than it is and deserves to be. But in the district, there is no such problem. They've been celebrating Emancipation Day unofficially on 16 April ever since 1866. They held a parade every year until 1901, then they took a century off, restarted it in 2002, and finally, 143 years after the fact, in 2005, Emancipation Day became an honest-to-God official city holiday in the District of Columbia. And nobody even spray-painted Emancipated Lives Matter on a major downtown thoroughfare. Thanks very much indeed for watching. See you next time. Have a great day and a pleasant tomorrow. Do not comply. Get off my lawn.